chapter 12 slash 4 will be revenue processes, 13 slash 5 will be um, procurement processes, kind of like what Jillian's is, and then we'll just do some of the other processes after that. Um, we are going to use our discussion of these processes to talk about um, various kind of more advanced capabilities of Microsoft Access. So we'll talk about revenue processes and we'll break it down into three sub-processes. The sales sub-process, the returns sub-process, and cash collection. We'll talk about how you might implement revenue processes using technology. Okay, so if you remember from the very first day of class, we had a picture like this that talked about various processes that make up the whole of an accounting system. You have the revenue process, the expenditure process, conversion processes, which is in fact inventory, converting raw materials to finished goods, um, and then various administrative processes, financial and basis, and they all feed the general ledger. We're going to talk about the first of those, which is revenue, getting money in. There are two different general revenue models. The first is business to business. The second is business to com com consumer. Um, they differ primarily on trust. Business to business is done with a trust relationship more often than not, where one business delivers goods to the other, they're billed at some time in the future, and then payment is collected after that future billing date. With consumers, you pay immediately. Even if you don't really pay immediately because you're using a credit card, you're paying immediately and the credit card company is trusting you, not the, not the business that you're doing business with. You know, the, the, the supermarket doesn't trust you. The credit card company trusts you and if you don't pay them, then they have recourse. So that's the difference between business to business and business to consumer. Everything is pretty much done at the point of sale with consumers and with businesses, it's done over time. You might have e-business or traditional business. Obviously, everyone has um, e-business. When I first started this course, we would differentiate between um, brick and mortar companies and e-business companies. Now everyone does both. Your dry cleaner does both. Yeah, every mom and pop sh shop ha has figured out a way to have an e-business component. And of course, you might make money by selling a product, either by pro producing it and then selling it or just merchandising it, or you might sell a service. So the first of the three processes would be the sales process. And pretty much, no matter what your company is, you do all of these things. You collect information for an order, you track the sale, you deliver the goods, you bill, record the receivable, and you bill the customer. And this is more done in the um, business to business environment. At some point, you may have to handle returns. That's both business to business or business to consumer. You collect your cash. You use this information to make future forecasts, analysis as to what you expect in terms of future sales, what you expect in terms of cash flow. And then you update a variety of database records, your accounts receivable, your cash, your inventory, um, et cetera. Some of the inputs to the sales process, the order, that drives it. You get an order in some form. And then you have debit and credit memoranda. Um, when there might be a problem, then you need to kind of reverse out either a, a sale or um, part of a sale because it was priced wrong. You have a debit or credit memoranda. A remittance advice, I count it as both an input and an output. How many of you get credit card bills from time to time? And on the bottom is that piece that you rip off and send back with your check. That's the remittance advice. It comes to you, more, is, more or less as something that you need to pay. And then you um, send it back at, to identify your payment. 
So it's a turnaround document. Shipping notices. Um, so when items are being shipped to a customer, that's a notice that tells them that it's been shipped. Your outputs are your invoice, which you send to your customer to get paid, business to business. The billing statement, which is just kind of a listing of all of your invoices. Bad debt reports, some kind of an aging report that says, you know, which customers owe money and for how long. At some point, aged receivables become bad debt when you have a very low expectation of receipt. Um, you might have a list of approved customers because they don't have any bad debts. You get off that approved customer list if you have bad debts. An analysis of all your sales so you understand what products work, what products don't work, etc. Cash receipts format. Ultimately, you need to have cash to run a company, and so you, you, you can use your sales information to start looking forward to understand where you might have some cash gaps. Very important for seasonal type businesses where they're feeding the entire company with their Christmas season, let's say. They're, se they're feeding the entire year. And then your financial statements, of course, are an output. Okay, what are the, some of the things that make the sales process complicated? or difficult, or error prone. If you have like a very, if you don't have a solid customer base, so you don't know your customers very well, and therefore you don't know your risks with your customers, that complicates your sales process. If you have one or very few key customers, that also complicates your sales process. If you do business with Walmart, or a better word, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe searches around for, everyone knows what Trader Joe's is? They search around for products that they think are of high quality, and then they kind of own the relationship with these companies because they're not very well-known companies. They're not big distributors. They own that relationship. So now those companies are at the whim of Trader Joe's. If Trader Joe's chooses not to use their product anymore, they're going to shrink dramatically. So that is a risk for any company. Certainly Walmart is always used as an example of a company where you know, they, they own you once you do business with them. Other um, complicating circumstances are in the products. If you have a product with a complex or frequently changing price, oil. You know, because if somebody's going to return that product later on, what's the price of the actual one that's being returned? You've probably seen that in a very small way. If any of you have ever bought something from, let's say, Macy's, and then three months down the line lost the receipt but want to return it, they'll take the return, but they're going to give you the lowest price that they sold it for in that three-month period or in, in, in any recent period. If you don't control your shipments directly, you run the risk of those shipments not being on time, not being um, done in a way that you can be satisfied with. If you sell a product mix that's difficult to differentiate, if you sell gravel, and depending upon the fineness of the gravel, that complicates the sales process. You can't differentiate it, and it's kind of hard to measure it as well. If you ship and you re keep records in many distributed locations, so you kind of lose control of your record keeping. These are all complicating circumstances that you need to have good internal controls to manage this. OK, the second process or sub-process is returns. So my daughter, two years ago, she's older now, what was in the high school senior prom. I guess you buy dresses for senior proms online. So what do you do? You buy like eight of them. You try them all on, and you send back seven of them. right? So be with the advent of e-business, particularly in the clothing sphere, where it's a tactile purchase, and you can't really feel it very well through a computer, 
there's a lot of returns. It's, a, it's more and more a part of natural business. There are certain um, stores in malls now that still hold on to the old no return policy. And they're going to lose out because returns have to be easy now because of e-business. Um, so sales returns are more and more a natural part, certainly of, of business to consumer, but also business to business. This is more on the procurement side when you get something from a vendor and you have a receiving dock like we have in the back of this building. You have somebody whose job it is is to make sure that if the vendor was supposed to ship you four pallets of something, you got all four pallets full of something. So it's the person who manages that. Well, the sales return process is pretty much like a receiving process. If someone says they're shipping you something back, you need a receiving report that says you got it. And a credit rep memorandum needs to reverse out um, the you know, charge. The returns process certainly has complicating factors. For customers, that one or few customers is a very complicating factor. If Walmart says, you know, we didn't like the quality of something that you just shipped to us, you take it back. You don't even think twice, right? You don't want to lose a bigger business for a small problem. So if you have very few customers, you have to bend over backwards for their needs. For the products, um, if you get returns, like we talked about this, if you have a flexible pricing process, that maybe, maybe your pricing process is based upon quantities purchased. They bought a they bought a hundred and they're returning fifty. They got a discount because they bought a hundred, and then you want to give them money back, but you don't want to give them money back based upon the fact that they bought a hundred. Now the money should go back based upon the fact what would it have cost them per item if they only bought fifty. So that complicates it if you have. Um, volume discounts. If you have a lot of returns, more than you should have, then maybe you have a problem with your product. Um, and you have to really, you should really account for this. This is more of an accounting issue, but account for this separately so you can understand um, how you're going to manage that better. And if you c accept returns in a distributed fashion, how do you bring that back together? This is a, a problem to some degree for in the um, internet age, you might buy something online and then return it in the store. They accept that. And so how do they get the information into the right databases? So that's the return process. Um, cash collection to 30 days. You have to pay within 30 days there. And this is a normal payment structure in the business to business world. And cash is incredibly important, right? Cash is where you need to have your best internal controls, the cash part of the revenue cycle. Because this, when people steal and there's any kind of theft, yeah, maybe they want your merchandise, but more likely they want your cash. And so if there's embezzlement or anything else going on, this is where you need to have the best internal controls. Okay. Again, if you have high volume of small cash collections or the decentralized, greater risk. And there's always risk involved with dealing in foreign currencies for now, now more than ever. The, the dollar is so strong. It's a great thing if you want to go overseas. It's a bad thing if you're an exporter. Okay, so we'll talk about three different ways that IT is involved with the sales process. We'll talk generally about e-business, which I think you all kind of know about. EDI, which um, I think we talked about briefly earlier, and point of sale systems, which I know we talked about briefly at the very beginning of the semester. So e-business could be either business to business or business to consumer. You, you live the business to consumer model, whether you're using Amazon or eBay or whatever you're using. The advantages of e-business um, from the seller's perspective the revenue producer's perspective, it reduces your cost. Fewer employees, if you do this right, you have the customer doing the data entry for you. Amazon has you doing the data entry for you, right, when you order something. So you, you have fewer employees necessary to do a lot of things. So that reduces your cost. Shortens the sales cycle. Because if 
the initial moment of the order is automated, everything after it can be automated. It just triggers everything. And of course, when you take hands off of the process, it does two things. It quickens it, and it reduces errors. So another way that you reduce cost is by reducing errors. So the third thing is it increases accuracy and reliability, because as we know, computers don't make mistakes. People make mistakes. And then it increases your potential market. Increases your potential market. You could be a small mom and pa. I, I, about five years ago, I was looking into buying a, a, a net making company. I don't know why. Somebody said, hey, look at this. I wasn't really thinking about it. And they had no internet access, but I looked at it. And they had no internet access or whatever. And I went online to look at net making, like soccer nets and that kind of stuff. And you see all these on the internet, all these net making companies. Now, you have no idea when you're looking at those, whether it's some small shop in Singapore that's doing it dirt cheap, or it's you know a big, mega colossal net making company. All you know is that they're on the internet. And they have a really good name that makes them sound big. So you, you, know, you know Amazon, but for the most part, you don't know. Nobody knows how big or small you are, unless they do a lot of research. So you increase your potential market. You're no longer local. You can become global very quickly through the internet. So that's e-business. EDI. EDI is the means of communicating between two companies. This ANSI X dot the general format used for EDI is there's some information. You, you send a file. M remember networking section we did, chapter four in our text. You send a file of information between, you know, over some network. It needs to be a somewhat flexible file format. If it's too structured, then everyone has to have the same thing and nobody's going to agree on what that format should be. So what this ANSI X.12 is, a very flexible way of formatting records to send back and forth so that the buyer, the receiver, and the sender can talk the same language, can have the same protocol, and get information back and forth without forcing everyone to be exactly alike. The idea of it is it's a, it's a tag value concept. So. You have header data that just says, this is, a, this is a record I'm about to send, and trailer data that says, we're done with that record. And in the middle, it, you have a tag and a value. So it'll, set, it'll send a tag which says, I'm sending you the order number. That order number is 1234. I'm sending you the amount. And it's $234, and so on. So by having a tag value body of the record, you can tell them what you're sending and the value associated with it, and it creates the flexibility. As long as everybody agrees to the standard, not the content, then you can have companies talk to each other in a flexible fashion. And that's what EDI does. The advantages of EDI, again, it it's in much the same way Amazon has you do data entry. EDI allows for the, allows the vendor to have the customer do the data entry in their own system. You do the you know or do the data entry if it's a just-in-time inventory system. When there's a trigger that says we need more inventory, that triggers an order for more inventory that goes directly to the, the correct vendor. So it, it eliminates data entry. It eliminates mail, you know, snail mail, paper-based mail. If done right, it allows you to reduce inventory, just-in-time inventory type of systems, because you are able to request your inventory quickly. And if you have the proper vendor relationship, you should receive it quickly. Your lead time for receipt should be small. It allows you to perform better customer service. And while this might get you more business, 
if your competitors are doing it, you might need to do this just to conserve your business. I need a, a real case for preserving your business. So when I was at Goldman, and it was what, 15 years ago I told you? It was the beginning of the process of EDI in the financial services. And I was involved in this. Fidelity, everyone's heard of Fidelity Investments, biggest mutual fund company in the world, wanted to create an EDI world for their sake. Goldman, which was doing great, recognized that this is a commoditizer. Makes all companies feel kind of the same. Didn't want to do it. And so I was involved in this. We recognized we had to, because fidelity is fidelity. You don't want to lose their relationship. So we were, we, we were forced into this environment, which was going to happen whether we did it or not, just to preserve our relationship with our number one client. So it's necessary to preserve business as well as to find new business. Some of the risks with EDI, obviously, this is the biggest risk out there for everybody these days. Security and confidentiality. Once you're sending data over unsecure lines, you run the risk that somebody's going to be able to get at it. Obviously, you're going to encrypt it. But even with that, it's proven to be difficult. Processing integrity. What if the buyer meant to order one of something and typed in 100, and therefore you shipped them quickly, because it's just in time. You shipped them 100 of something and only wanted one. You have to deal with those kinds of mistakes. This incomplete audit trail. By incomplete, they mean not paper-based. You don't have a paper audit trail. You only have computer audit trail. And you had, have to be very good at taking these, these EDI files and integrate them with your back end systems. And finally, if you're relying on computers to do your job, you better have computers that are working 24 7. If Amazon were to go down, it's not EDI, but if Amazon wants to go down, they're out of business. So you, you need to have the proper fault tolerance in your systems. And we're going to have a separate section and we'll talk about controls, authentication, make sure that the other side is who you think they are, encryption, when you're sending data back and forth, you, you encrypt it so that a third party would have a great deal of difficulty de-encrypting it. You log all your transactions for an audit trail. You use things like control totals to make sure everything looks realistic. and to prevent against the possibility that somebody entered data wrong, you have acknowledgment. They send you something, you say, you, you really want 100? And if they say, yeah, then you send them 100. POS systems. They could be either a touch screen, like at McDonald's, or a barcoding scanning, like at a supermarket. They're both POS systems, point to sell. It allows immediate access to inventory and pricing data, updating inventory da data so you potentially will trigger a new order. And if somebody had in central office changed the price that day, it's right there. It links to any credit card authorizations. It updates, as we said, cash for cash forecasting, sales data and inventory data it's for immediate analyses. It doesn't have to wait till the end of a period. And it automatically integrates with the general ledger. You all live with point of sale systems every day. It reduces risk of pricing errors. Since you have more control over your cash, the risk of cash overages or shortages. Though you have point of sale systems, that doesn't resolve things like um, people stealing. That still happens. It doesn't go through the system. So once a year, twice a year, Big department stores are going to hire a lot of people, and they count what they have on the shelves to know where they've lost inventory. OK, so how do you implement it? So this is kind of sort of like a context level DFD. Inputs, outputs, but not really. And then the process in the middle. This is from your cyber textbook. 
Here's an example of an ER diagram for the revenue cycle. It's obviously generic, so the cardinalities may or may not fit a specific one. And it starts with really sales orders, shipping, collections, and returns. Those are the. Okay. And up here you have feedback and salespeople. This is really not an economic event, but this is a part of the cycle. It's really not as hard as it looks. REA, it's in the format of an REA. Resources, inventory, cash. And, and more inventory. Plenty of stuff. But here, this is what your solution is going to look like, right? The name of the table, primary key, foreign keys, concatenated key. Lots of tables. Context DFD. Level zero DFD, a process DFD. Maybe for one of those processes, I don't know which one it is. Um, record sales order 2.0. You want more detail? Here's a level one. This is what you do to record the, the sales order. You check for credit. You check whether the item is on, in stock. You enter the order, and then you acknowledge it. This might be what your um, relationship table looks like in Microsoft Access. To the extent possible, when you organize your tables on the relationship screen, I recommend organizing it REA for a couple of reasons. One, it'll allow you to go back and say, is this logical? Do we have everything? And two, if you think about the connections, the connections ought to be REA. That's the one to many. And so it'll just allow you to connect things in a proper way. It's just an organizational manner to do it that keeps everything structured well. Some of the outputs, some of the other types of objects you might have, you'd have a sales order form. Today you're going to learn how to, I don't know if you create the sales order form, I think you do. But you'll learn how to create a form with a list in the form. So a sale, when you think about a sales order, you have the general information about the customer that you're, you're, the order is for, and then all of the different items that they're ordering, because they could order more than one item. So that's a list that can go on and on and on for as long as it needs to go on. And then down here would just be some total information. So it has a main form. It's called a main form and a sub form. In Microsoft Access, you'll learn how to calculate fields. Extension is quantity sold times price. And then the subtotal and the totals are calculated as well. You'll learn how to create some drop down boxes, let's say for description. Or well, for item number, you might drop down a box to see all the possible item numbers. You might have a macro. You, I know some of you, when, we, when you were entering the item information through your forms in the other day, you said, how do I know what it's in? Because you just hit enter, and then it brings up a new blank one. So instead of just hitting enter and bringing up a new blank form, you might hit record cell. And that'll give you more comfort that, yeah, it's being recorded on the tables, and it'll bring up a new blank one. Then you'd have the maintenance processes. So if you wanted to change the price on the widget, you can come to one of these screens and just change the price, and it'll change in the database. And you would also use it if you wanted to add a new product. It could be an add or maintain process. An output might be an invoice. Notice the way an invoice looks. This looks like something you'd print out. So you need to think about things like page breaks and stuff like that and format, making it look nice. Some of the various control techniques that you could use as you develop your forms, and this is in your text. You could create the metadata so that it's of a certain type. You can establish ranges of valid data.
You might have a validity check. You might want to use it for um, a state, you know, a two-digit state if you didn't have a drop-down menu. Valid combinations. You could theoretically um, make sure that your quantity on hand is never less than your reorder point, or make sure that a zip code exists within a given state if you want to put that test in. Closed loop verification. This is very important for you all. The concept of closed loop verification says, types in an item number, one, two, three, because they think they want to buy item number one, two, three. You should be, the, the system should, dis, they wouldn't also type in widget, one, two, three, widget. The system knows what one, two, three is. Closed loop verification says, you type in one, two, three, we will display back to you widget. That way, if you didn't really want to buy a widget, you wanted to buy a doodad, and that's really one, two, four, you would see that, oh, I'm getting a widget, I want a doodad, and then you would change it to one, two, four. So closed loop verification says, when you enter information that's kind of generic in nature, like a, a number like that, bring back the information that allows the end user to, def to confirm that they've entered the right thing. Queries. This is a query of, from two different tables. And you might want to show sales orders between two dates. You set up a query to look like this. 